I'm Dr. Ron England, and this is COP3530 COP data structures, and we're well into trees, and if you've been following the whole lecture series on trees, we're now into balancing trees. Wow, we've got our trees to work, now we want to make them balance. So first we're going to need to know what a balanced tree is, and why is it even important that we know how to balance trees? Once you realize that we do need to balance trees and that they're important, you're going to have to come up with some algorithms that keep trees balanced, especially if you know what a balanced and a non-balanced tree is. And also realize that when you've got to deal with balancing trees, you've also got to balance the issues that deal with performance. When to balance, why to balance, and how to balance are all those things that you've got to deal with when you're talking about balancing trees. So first, what is a balanced tree? Well, a balanced tree, essentially, and, and you can look at a tree and say it's balanced. It looks like the left and the right are relatively equal. They're about the same depth. The leaves are about the same level. Well, when we say balanced tree, we actually have a specific definition that the difference in height of any subtree is between zero and one. And it's perfectly balanced if it's balanced and all of the leaves, all of those bottom level nodes are on one level or another level. So in other words, they're, they're never more than one level different from each other. So it's, you may not be able to perfectly get a tree where every leaf is on one level, but you better get them on to two levels to have a balanced tree. Why? Well, the first reason of why is because it makes it much easier to traverse the tree. And the main reason why we traverse a tree is to look for something. We're looking for something that's held in the tree. If the tree has an organization scheme, then you simply go from the top node, follow your organization scheme to find the node where something is contained to get to it. And if it's balanced, you don't have to go very far to get it. So if you looked at the one on the right and you're at A and you need to get to P, well, now you're going to have to go from A to G to K to L to P. Blah. But if you're on the one on the left, you just go G, L, P, and you're there. It's the difference between O of N, hopefully you know your own big O notation, and O of log N. And that is a huge difference, especially when you're talking about performance of systems that have to do these over and over again. And if you don't you know, consider performance important, you know how irritating it is when you're sitting there on your phone and you start clicking on things and you sit there and you're like, why isn't it doing it? And then it waits a few seconds to do it. Performance is important. So let's start balancing them. And we're going to start with an algorithm called the DSW algorithm. I'm not going to cover in details all of the parts of the DSW algorithm, but I am going to cover some of the very important concepts of the DSW algorithm. It's an algorithm somebody thought up Okay. Actually, more than people, one person thought up. They published it that allows you to balance a tree. It can take any tree and it can make a balanced tree out of it. And it does it without destroying the organization scheme of the tree. It's got some crucial parts and we're going to look at those crucial parts. The steps of the algorithm is the first thing that it does is it converts the binary tree into essentially what is either a right linked list or a left linked list. It doesn't matter which one you do because a right linked list and a left linked list essentially just saying, okay, we're only going to use the right pointer of any node to point to something else. That would be a right linked list and we leave all the left pointers blank. Well, when you do that, it's essentially a tree becomes a linked list. And then you convert it back into a tree maintaining the organization scheme of the tree, if you're, your, your sorting scheme. The beauty of the DSW is it does everything with the existing nodes and existing pointers. It doesn't need temporary nodes or whatever to do this. It does it all built in. So it uses the existing nodes, moves the pointers around, and then moves them back. The key to the DSW algorithm is the rotate function. And the rotation is, is really kind of an interesting thing. The concept that I can take a group of nodes, I can move them around and maintain the organizational scheme. If my organizational scheme was less to the left, more to the right, it doesn't lose that 
but it rotates them. It moves them either to the right or to the left. What we're going to show here is the rotate that rotates to the right. It's a very clever scheme. So here are, it's a three-step scheme. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to move pointers. I'm going to repeat that. All I'm going to do is I'm going to change some pointers. So looking at my tree, I've got a grandparent, a parent, a child, and then I've got an X, Y, and a Z node. I just threw some extra nodes in there so that everything else down the line was filled out. I could have also put another node on the left-hand side of the grandparent. I didn't do that because I didn't need to because uh, I don't touch that pointer. But here I've got this, a grandparent, a parent, and a child. You know, and that's the, those are the ones that are going to rotate. Okay, you should understand how that works, grandparent, parent, child, right? So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set the right pointer of the grandparent equal to the left child, okay? The left child of the parent. That's so, and if, if you look at my picture here, I converted the existing pointer to black. It would have been blue. And I replaced it with the one in red. So it's going to change. The black's going to go away. The red's going to change. And then step two, I take the left pointer of the parent, okay, and I set it to be equal to the, the left child's right pointer, where it is pointing at. Which the, so the, so the, the left child's right pointer is pointing at the Y. So I actually take it from the child to the Y. Okay, so I make those two changes. And when I do that, I'm going to get this guy that's over here on the left. I've got one more change to make. But if you look at what I've changed, the grandparent points to the child, the child still points to the Y. Okay, now I've got one last one to do. I take the left child's right pointer, okay, the left child's right pointer, and I flip that back to the parent. Okay, I just did three steps. Three things got moved. So three, three pointers were changed and things got moved. So I started with this looking thing here with the black pointers being the ones that were actually there because the reds are the ones I added and the blacks are the ones I took away. And I end up after rotation with now the grandparent pointing to the child, pointing to the parent with the X and the Y and the Z in different spots. Now we're going to show that there's a beauty to that and that it doesn't change some fundamental principles of this, but what it's done is it shifted over to the right. If I kept doing this over and over again, realizing that if there's nothing, if the pointer, like if the first one, the first step, which was, the first step was the grandparent's right pointed to the left child. Well, that one actually, the right is always going to be, but if there was no left child, you simply don't do that step. Once I do these steps, Okay, and it's easy. You can look up DSW algorithm. You can see animations of this online. There's plenty of ways to look at this, but this rotate right is a very clever algorithm. I end up with stuff over to the right. And if I keep repeating it over and over again, in the end, I'm going to have a tree that is a single linkless line, all using right pointers. That's step one of the DSW algorithm. Step two. So this is, this is creating a backbone. Now, we need to take the backbone and we need to put it back into a tree and it needs to be balanced. So I get to the backbone, everything's a right pointer. The steps of the backbone are very straightforward. I'm not even going to read them out. But essentially what you're doing is you're repeating the same process over and over and over again until you get to a perfectly straight backbone right pointers. By the way, you could also do this all on the left. Okay, work the same way. It's just when you put it back together, you're going to have to make different choices along that way too. The next thing that we've got to do, we've got this linked list. We've got to convert it back. So how do we convert this back? Well, the conversion back is going to essentially be a series of rotate lefts. You saw rotate right. Now we're going to rotate left. And we need to know how many, before we start, we need to know how many rotate lefts we're going to have to do. And if you think about it a little bit, it actually makes sense. First thing we're going to do is we're going to calculate the greatest power of two less than the number of nodes. Huh? Well, again, if you think about it, it makes sense. 
Because it's a binary tree, you got one node at the top, and then you got two at the next level, and then you got four at the next level, then you got eight at the next level, and you got 16 at the next level. What am I doing? Doing powers of two. So the number of rotations that you need to do will get you down to those levels. And that's what you're going to calculate first. Then you're going to take this, make a value, which is essentially x minus 1, which is your number of nodes minus 1, because the top node is the 1. Then you call an algorithm called make rotations with the number of nodes minus the number of levels, because m is essentially going to be the number of levels that you're going to have on this. I know it sounds really, but it sounds, you got to sit and think about it. It's a fairly complex algorithm. Remember, guys worked on how to make this algorithm work and wrote a paper on it. How do, you, how do you do this? It's a very fundamental paper, but this is the algorithm, the DSW. So the make rotations is essentially going to say, I'm going to call rotate left so many times. So what do you do? You say, I've got this number of the number of times I need to, to do this. I'm going to rotate left. I'm going to move a few pointers, and I'm going to do it again and again throughout the bounds. And the tree will expand back out from its single line into a nice, beautiful balanced tree. Okay. The best way to look at this, if you want to understand this algorithm, is look at some of the wonderful animations online of the DSW algorithm. And all you got to do to find it is to Google DSW algorithm. There's not a whole lot of other ones out there. So Google's going to be pretty good at getting you to some sources for the DSW. The crucial piece of this was that rotate function. Very clever. I do want people to understand that rotate function, that concept of moving three pointers and rotating the tree around because it's used in other things. So let's look at a type of tree, an AVL tree. Now, the DSW was an algorithm. It wasn't a tree. An AVL is a type of tree, an actual physical data structure and implementation, and it is a self-balancing uh, binary search tree. And so it is going to be a balanced tree. By definition, an AVL tree is a balanced tree because it's, that's what it does. Now, the AVL tree includes in it the mechanism by which it maintains balance. So what happens in an AVL tree is if it gets out of balance, it balances itself. So it looks through itself and says, oh, I'm going to calculate the height of any individual set of nodes. And if I find that I've got nodes that are out of balance, I'm going to perform a balancing act. And if you remember that rotating balancing act, it actually worked in that everything was maintained and it was all done in place. So this is what an AVL rotation would look like with colors. I decided to do it with colors. The, and literally, the colors are, you know, the colors there, the blue, the yellow, the red, the purple, and the green are the nodes. They're not just random colors I threw in there. The blue which is the root in the left-hand side, becomes the left child of the red, which is now the root in the right-hand side. They do move that way. They go through that rotation function to get moved that way. And so the purple and the yellow and the green move around a little bit as you work through it to get to that. that. But you know what's really interesting about AVL rotation? Let's look at the one on the left and put some actual values in there, and let's follow a rule less to the left, more to the right. Okay, so I put some numbers in there and I look to see what happens. I start with a five, less to the left, one is left. More to the right, I put an eight there, eight. Okay, the eight's got a seven and a nine. Again, less to the left, more to the right. I implement the rotation function for the AVL, which I did. Nothing's changed. Eight is now at the top and it's got a five and a nine. It's got less to the left, more to the right. The five has got less to the left, more to the right, one and seven. It maintained the rules. So the ability to do rotation maintained the structure, the, 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 the strategy of how I'm going to organize things in the actual tree. So it's pretty neat how it did that. When you, if you were to build an AVL tree, it's going to be able to have to handle things. It's got to be able to handle insertions. It's going to have to be able to handle deletions. But what's going to happen is if you do an insertion or you do a deletion, guess what? You're going to rebalance the tree. There's going to be a set of rules for when and where you rebalance and when you decide when to do that because it's going to have to be able to calculate the height. 
I'm not going into all the details of those. Those are really things that you can sit down and work out by hand, working your way through the algorithm. And there's plenty of examples of the algorithm and pseudocode out there to work with. The crucial part of that, though, is understanding that that AVL tree, how it does that rotation function, and how it maintains the structure of the tree to do these things. Now, the heap. You've seen these trees. You've seen an AVL tree, which is one of my favorites, because it's an interesting tree to look at conceptually, and that concept of self-balancing is really awesome. But the heap, the heap's got some serious uses to it. And then the heap, simple definition, the value stored in each node is not less than the value in each of the children. That is a heap. Okay, so essentially, the big numbers are on top. Okay, that simple perfectly balanced, okay, and if you got something left over, okay, you stick it in the left before you stick it in the right. That's a heap. Well, you think, well, that's kind of, why would a heap be special? It's got some of these interesting properties, but the heap's got some special things about it because what a heap allows you to do is implement a priority queue. Okay, well, great. It's a heap, a heap is a data structure. It's got these rules. It self-balances. Well, I know what a data structure is. I know what, how I can set up rules for a data structure. A heap seems like it's a pretty simple set of rules. You know, biggest on the top, keep it balanced. That's pretty much all you got to think of. But a heap lets you do something called a priority queue. Well, why is a priority queue important? Well, the reason a priority queue is important is because they're extremely useful in prioritizing things, and a tree structure allows them to do that. Well, you know what a queue is. Okay, queue in, queue. Okay, you get in the back of the line, boom, you come out the front of the line. That's a queue. What does a priority queue that's different do? Well, priority queue says, okay, somebody comes into the back of the line, but they're a VIP. They can get moved to the front of the line automatically while the line structure is still maintained. Well, you know, we you know, like, like anybody cutting in line, but think about this in terms of stuff in computer science. What if you've got, let's say, a network, and the network is handling video streaming, which can accept loss, and TCIP, TCP IP, which cannot handle loss? Who are you going to give the priority to? Well, if you give the priority to the video stream, then you might be losing packets in the TCP IP and cause the network to jam. Whereas the, 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 the video protocol can actually handle some losses of that. So then you throw your priority to the TCP IP stack. All over computer science, there are situations where you want to give priority to some things over other things. Another good example is in rendering of 3D objects in a video game. It's more important to render the big objects than the little tiny objects, okay? The things that the users are gonna see first, okay? You wanna give them priority. That way it looks like a seamless experience to the users. There you go, priorities, queued. And when you're gonna have to render everything, it's gonna be a queue, okay? But now I can set priorities. So priority queues are extremely useful. Understand, performance, with all types of things is an issue. Beauty of trees, highly efficient, O of log n. You really can't get too much better than O of log n. Essentially, the one better than that is O of one. And there's not a whole lot more better than that. But you need to balance the tree on a regular basis to be able to do this. Okay, well, how do you do that? Well, you know what, one way I can do that is I can set up a priority queue to say when is the time when the computer is being used the least to do the rebalancing. I've now used a tree to solve a problem with my performance. Okay, there's all sorts of times when the computer system is idle. Let's use that time to do the rebalancing. See, I've got a strategy right there. Now this is all should be coming together. These things do make sense. And as we move into more into the things like bee trees, you're going to say, oh, well, these are really interesting things that I never knew I could do so much with such a simple conceptual structure. So do you know what a tree is? Do you know what a balanced tree is? 
Can you, could you implement an algorithm to balance a tree? I'm, you know, from the pseudocode, I'm not saying that you have to create the algorithm, I'm saying that you should be able to take an algorithm and build it. For, you know, take the algorithm that's already given and, and, and implement it in code. Why are, why are balancing trees important? What are the advantages of them over other types of trees? And understand that those things that go on when you're doing balancing trees do have performance associated with them, but you've got that ability to offset that performance somewhere else. So you're getting into some really interesting computer science and, and IT stuff here. And we're gonna keep moving on with these, but I'm hoping you're really enjoying this concept of trees and moving, and moving through trees and soon we're on, gonna be on to graphs and some other more advanced algorithms. It's getting to some interesting. So anyway, Dr. Ron England, coming to you from Daytona State College. I hope you really enjoyed this lecture. Thanks. <laughs>